You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the New School for Social Research. The New School for Social Research is a world-renowned graduate school in New York City, offering master's and doctoral programs in the social sciences and humanities. New School students and faculty work to understand social problems through progressive interdisciplinary scholarship and create new ideas in the world. To learn more about the New School for Social Research, visit newschool.edu. nssr Okay, hello Guy. Thank you very much indeed for taking the time today to talk to me about the plunder of the commons, the topic of your uh, most recent book. And, uh, you know, for, for people who might not be in that subject uh, very much, could you maybe start by explaining what exactly do you, do you mean by the commons? Uh, what has the historic role been of the commons? The, 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 commons, <clears throat> the commons are essentially public resources, uh, the nature, the social amenities that we inherit, the civil institutions, everything which is not private property and not state property. We also have an idea of commoning, the verb to common, which is to act in the commons and through shared activities. And the commons have always been very important throughout history. And what the book does is show that at the beginning of the British Constitution, there was a charter of the forest, which effectively enshrined the rights of the commons, the rights of commoners to subsist in the commons, to have access to the means of work and for a home and the means of subsistence. So the commons has always been an important part of our society. And one of the problems has been is that over time, over the many centuries, there have been various forms of plunder, various forms by which the commons have been taken away from commoners, us, all of us, because the commons in the end belongs to everybody, but belongs to nobody, paradoxically. And today we are seeing a new plunder, a new form of depletion of our commons. And that, I think, is the, is the fundamental challenge we have before us. So is the, the chart of the forest that you, that you mentioned, uh, is this the sort of first document actually enshrining this right to the commons? Yes, and it was, it was sealed in November 1217 in St. Paul's Cathedral in, in London, the original St. Paul's. And I don't think it, it would have been sealed had it not been the fact that the king at the time was 10 years old and he probably didn't understand what was being done in his name. But it was a remarkably subversive document because it, it, it returned large parts of the land to the commoners, the commoners uh, that had been taken by successive monarchs and by successive aristocrats. And it was the first charter, an environmental charter, that asserted the need to preserve nature at the same time as allowing the commoners to exist in the commons. And you can see it as establishing the whole set of principles of the commons, which then, of course, have been defended and attacked in various ways that I show in the book. And, uh, you know, that this is the UK example where the commons have been enshrined in the Charter of the Forest. Uh, how, was this, how was this done in other countries uh, across Europe? Well, when they had the 800th anniversary of the Charter of the Forest, I received a, a, an email from the American Bar Association uh, from a very senior member of the American Bar Association. And he said that the Charter of the Forest had been more influential in the uh, defining of the American Constitution than the Magna Carta itself. And everybody knows about the Magna Carta, which was sealed on the same day as the Charter of the Forest in 1217. 
And, and it, it, the Charter of the Forest and the Principles of Commons have actually been, in all democracies, have been a part of the constitutions. And the Commons, I think, is, is a, a vitally important today because the agenda of neoliberalism since Thatcher and Reagan began it, have been eroding the remaining commons. And it's very important to appreciate that this context has, has profoundly threatened what has, is a very rich commons that still exists. Essentially, what Thatcher did was she said in that famous statement, there is no such thing as society. And I point out in the book that I don't think she would have objected if the tense of the verb had been changed and it had read, there should be no such thing as society. Because basically, she, she derived her economics, for whatever value you put on those, her economics, from uh, Frederick van Hayek. And Frederick van Hayek was an adherent of the Austrian school of economics von Mises and so on, and the Mont Pelerin Society and all of those people who became influential in the 1970s and 1980s drew from the Austrian school. And an essential theorem of the Austrian school was and is that something that has no price has no value. And the commons, of course, has no price. We value our parks, we value the green, we value our, our water, we value the air, we value our social amenities like libraries and museums and things. They don't have a price, um, and, and, but we value them. But in their, their ideology, something that has no price can be given away or sold or commodified. And that has been the, the underlying ideological uh, premise of what has been happening to our commons. So they have been allowing the privatization of our public amenities. They've been allowing the privatization and commodification of all forms of nature. And governments have no right to take our commons because the commons belong to all of us. And, and this, this is a, a plunder, a theft of the commons. And what I do in the book is look at the five types of commons. The natural commons, which is what most people think about when we uh, talk again, about... Let me take one step back before we come to the last sort of 40 odd years or so. So you mentioned that the Charter of the Forest was signed early in the 13th century. Uh, right. and, and, and then we, we got, we got on to the, the Thatcher Revolution and how the economics of the Austrian school um, has influenced their thinking. So what happened in the, in the meantime? Uh, what, was this basically plain sailing or have there been plunders before? Yeah, the, there had been plunders throughout history since the 13th century. But the remarkable thing is that the Charter of the Forest was longer on the statute books, the British statute books, than any other piece of legislation in history. It was only reformed by a conservative government in 1971. So it was on the statute books. But... Throughout that period, there had been a struggle between those who wanted to take away the commons and those who defended the commons. Thus, we had the situation that the Tudors, the King, the King Henry VIII and around them, they effectively took 8 million acres of land that had been commons and gave them to a new aristocratic elite in return for allegiance to the king. Then we had another period in the, in the 17th century when more of the land was taken. Now, all of this time, there were struggles by the peasantry, struggles by workers to resist the loss of the commons. And we go back and, and the great famous 1381 Peasants' Revolt was about trying to defend the commons against enclosure and it being taken away. And we go through into the 19th century when there were over 5,000 acts of parliament, which was an elite parliament, which 5,000 acts of enclosure. 
taking away another 7 million acres of land, common land, and giving it effectively to uh, an aristocracy. So by the late 19th century, Britain had the most concentrated land ownership of any other country. And it has that today. So for example, the biggest landowner in Britain today is a lovely name. He's the Duke of Buclos. And the Duke of Buclos inherited 277,000 acres of good land. And the only way he did it is he's the 10th descendant of an illegitimate child of Charles, King Charles II uh, in, the, in the 1660s. And he has that land, and a lot of other very big landowners have the land, and they've taken it. Now, what happened then is that not only was land concentrated, but all the resources on the land and under the land became privatized, if you like. But what Thatcher did was extend that. And she extended it, first of all, by taking school playgrounds and privatizing the state uh, playgrounds, and then she privatized water. Water is a commons. Water is a commons, but she privatized uh, all water supply in 1989, and it became uh, private property. Private corporations were given monopolistic ownership of our water supply. And what happened then was that they piled up those corporations with debt, took the profits, gave them to foreign uh, shareholders around the world, and private equity now owns our rivers. And the incredible thing is that in, to save costs, the water companies have been pouring untreated sewage into our rivers and uh, into the sea. And as a consequence today, a new report has just come out saying that no English river is safe to drink or to swim in. And it is an extraordinary thing that they've been breaking the law by you, this sewage work, but they've been making vast profits. So we had a privatization of water. And at the same time, Thatcher gave away 424,000 acres of common land to these new water companies. So that was the first step. Then we had the privatization of our railway system uh, in 1993. Now, the railway system was part of our commons. It, it had been inherited, it had been built up, and it was part of our commons. They had no right to do that. And you go on and you see in, in area after area how what has been happening is the privatization, and far more importantly, and this is something that came across in writing of the book, what we've seen, and it's in other countries as well, not just Britain, is that in the process of privatizing our commons, it has led to the colonization of our commons. In other words, more and more of what we had as our commons have passed into the hands of foreign private equity. And this has dramatically altered the income distribution system, the ownership pattern, and the, the loss of our amenities, our libraries, our museums, our, 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 our national health service has been largely privatized. We still think of the NHS as a public commons, but in actual fact, as I show in the book, most, most of what's been happening is that American private uh, health companies and private equity have been taking more and more contracts from the national health. Same thing with elder care and child care. Increasingly, they're not part of our commons. They're part of private profit making from foreign capital. So it's an extraordinary transformation of what has been happening to British society and seeing it through the lens, through seeing it through the, the commons is a very powerful way because the commons has always tended to reduce inequality in Britain. And now what we're seeing is that the inequalities that have been taking place in Britain have been intensified by the loss of the commons.
And that phenomenon is something that has not been taken into account in assessments of what's been happening to inequality in general. Okay, and before we come to the effects of, uh, of the plunder of the commons, uh, you, you briefly already alluded to five types uh, of the commons that you identify. Uh, can, you, can you spell out again uh, what these specific five types are? Well, the first type of the, is nature, natural commons. Now, that includes the land, the water, the air, the seabed, the uh, minerals under the, the land or under the water of, of the country. And in all of those respects, there has been this process of privatization and colonization. The second area is the social commons. Now, the social commons are defined as the the facilities and amenities that have been inherited as part of society. They are something established in the past that have been inherited by our generations that belong to us in general. And where we've seen that taking place is, for example, council housing. Council housing has been largely privatized. So we have two million fewer council housing units today than we did in 1980. A huge loss of a social commons. Student accommodation is another form of social commons. It used to be part of the university system. The university system was part of our commons. But we've had a privatization of all student accommodation so that today something like 80% of all student uh, apartments are owned by foreign companies. And in particular, the biggest one is Goldman Sachs. So we have our student accommodation around the country largely owned by Goldman Sachs. It's an extraordinary development. But you can go on thinking of the biggest uh, social trend in terms of the social commons has been what's called POPs, P-O-P-S. And what POPs are is privately owned public spaces. And what we've seen across the country, and it's in other countries as well, is that more and more the parts of our cities and towns have been privatized and sold to foreign property corporations. So large parts of central London that we've, we've seen as part of our commons since they were there hundreds of years ago, are now owned by private equity corporations from New York or from, uh, uh, from Malaysia, from China, and so on. And they have the right under the existing legislation to, to police their own areas. So we have, a, a, alongside the, the growth of POPs, you have private regulations private control, so they can stop people like you and me going in squares and streets and their par private parks, which we think are part of our commons, but in actual fact, they have been lost. It's the same with things like urban trees. Every town in, and city in Eng England and Wales and Scotland is famous for having trees alongside the, on, the, on the pavements, as you know. Well, what we don't appreciate is they've been privatizing the care of those trees, in effect, privatizing what happens to those trees. And where that's happened, what's happening is that they're cutting down big trees, beautiful, beautiful big trees, because they cost a lot to maintain, and they're putting small trees instead, or no trees, and we're having the character of our cities change because of the privatization of our commons. And you can see a lot of other social commons that have been that have been lost, libraries, public libraries that have been privatized or closed. And 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 the, the railway system I mentioned earlier. So the, the chapter on the loss of the, the social commons, I think, is pretty comprehensive and and shows what's been happening. The third the third form of commons that has been lost is is the civil commons. And I, when, I found, when I found myself reading that chapter again for my presentation next week at the LSE, um, I got most angry about that. 
The civil commons are the common law, the common law institutions, the common law principles inherited from Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest. The idea that nobody should be found guilty of anything unless there's a proper trial, unless you have legal representation, unless there's due process. In other words, the person can have a chance to represent themselves or have a, a, a lawyer represent them and contest a charge. It's an extraordinary reality that we have had many developments in our legal system over the last 30 years, but particularly in the last 10 years, where due process has been lost. Today, for example, in our social policy, universal credit, um, a bureaucrat can sanction somebody and take away their benefits just on the basis that he thinks something has happened. Now, that, in fact, destroys someone's life. If you get no benefits because a bureaucrat has decided to take them away, it could lead you to suicide or mental breakdown because you've got no income, right? But it's being done without any legal process. It's just young bureaucrat who decides. You don't, you don't have the right to have your benefit anymore. There's no, there's no proof. There's no evidence. There's no trial, right? It's hugely important for ordinary people, members of the precariat, the same with the privatization of litter cleaning in our streets. It's been privatized, and those private companies can literally, on the spot, in the street, fine people for dropping a piece of paper. They can fine them 100 pounds or 150 pounds, but there's no trial, there's no evidence. They can just do it. And what the evidence shows is that they've been targeting low-income people, vulnerable people who are in the street. And to lose 100 pounds or 150 pounds just for dropping a piece of paper is, is, could be destructive of their whole lifestyle. But they're doing it through a privatization process that, for me, is completely illegitimate loss of our civil commons. And the same thing with privatizing of our prisons. It's an extraordinary thing that the prisons are, in a sense, part of our commons. But if you privatize them, the private companies have an incentive to maximize the number of people they keep in prison because they're paid by the number of prisoners they have. They privatize the, the probation service. So the probation service has been really destroyed, in effect, so badly so that they're now having to admit they're going to take it back into public ownership next year. So it goes on with the loss of the civil commons. The next aspect is the loss of the cultural commons. Culture is inherently part of society. Public culture is part of every society. If you don't have public culture, you don't have society. But increasingly, the resources for our museums, our theatres, our public art have been cut, and they've been forcing them to adopt the American model of relying on multinational corporations and big donors for exhibitions, for museums, etc. And of course, if you do that, then they, sh they shape what is done in exhibitions and what is put on in shows and so on. And there's been a loss of the culture in many respects because in schools and in universities, the cultural subjects have been frozen out by the emphasis on human capital and job preparation. So music teaching in our secondary schools right across the country has virtually disappeared because it is part of our commons and is easily cut. And that's been happening. So you, you get a Philistine tendency in the erosion of your cultural commons. And finally, and very importantly, very, very much 21st century issue, we've seen a plunder of our knowledge commons, our information commons, which has been turned over largely to social media dominated by the big tech in, in the Silicon Valley that they are dominant, plus the plutocracy owning our, our media, 
all our newspapers and and whereas local newspapers with with the vernacular values of local things have been uh, have been killed effect, effectively and we've been losing the intellectual column uh, commons because of the development of the US intellectual property rights system with its patents and copyrights strengthened by the World Trade Organization which has allowed rent seeking which i've written a, a lot about and in effect privatized ideas which is a terrible development of modern times to a much greater extent than it used to be and then finally we've seen an erosion of our education commons our schools our universities are increasingly commodified commercialized and geared to job seeking and and away from teaching people to think critically about society i believe that the loss of the education commons is a major cause of the drift to accepting populist neo-fascist politicians and political agendas we need to revive the education commons so that people can hear different perspectives and learn how to think critically and you you i'm sure understand much better than most how we find today more and more students are coming out unable to understand basic politics unable to understand a critical uh, progressive uh, way of thinking because they're not taught that sort of thing in a commodified system so we've lost all of those forms of commons and i think seeing what's happening through the angle of the commons makes more people aware of the depth of the crisis and the need for us collectively to respond and i believe that precariat understands that best but also middle class people so there is a natural cross cross class alliance for an agenda to recover the commons and what i proposed in the book is a charter of the commons with 44 articles leading up to a demand that the commoners you me and everybody else should be compensated for the loss of our commons okay before we come to the solution uh, let me let me try to summarize uh, what you what you analyzed in your five commons so if i got you uh, correctly we basically had the situation that the natural commons were sold off the social commons the government abdicated responsibility for them Uh, the civil commons introduced the legal inequality that you know you're just at the whim of uh, whoever then decides to fine you. The cultural commons were just devaluated, and the knowledge and education commons uh, were commercialized and uh, you know put put up with different incentives. I mean, you mentioned the the university system. Um, Especially in the university system, the reforms that we've seen over recent decades have set completely different incentives uh, for students as well as for academics. You know, both of us worked at universities for for a long time. Uh, we know this. So, uh, and and especially <laughs> against the backdrop of what is happening, that this sort of specialized technical knowledge that is now being uh, being pushed at universities because you know preparing them for the job market. And might have a, a a much shorter lifespan because developments are so quick. And even though you know, oh. I think John Kay it was who uh, several years ago wrote a column in the Financial Times, say a liberal arts education now would serve you better in the, in the long term. Uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. But but of course that's been frozen out, as you say. Uh, your summary was very very pertinent because that's essentially it. I I I think the one thing that. Uh, you didn't mention is that in all respects, in all five respects, what is emerging is the systematic colonization of all types of the commons, in the sense that with all those things that you've mentioned, have gone the, the increasing power of private equity capital and financial capital in taking the, the various commons. So that, in effect, the power and for for exploitation and and value extraction has passed to a global elite operating through the financial capital and operating through uh, the, the financial institutions, and that I think is 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 a really bad feature of what's happened. I mean, against this backdrop, how how do you see the situation uh, in which we are currently, where a new commons 
is try to be established, the digital commons. Yeah. Right? So there is a there is a, a lively debate, especially in the digital realm, uh, you know, where there is a a very clear conflict, uh, very similar to what you described in, in all sorts of other areas between commodified and you know, commercialized interests, uh, as well as well, a digital commons, access to free knowledge and so on and so forth. So what's your take on the digital commons? Well, I mean, that is, that is covered under the, uh, the chapter seven on the information commons, the digital commons, the domination by by Google and and Amazon and and Facebook and and so on, they they are extracting enormous profits from us, the digital commons. Every time you and I go on to our computer, we are providing them with income, because we are giving them information, personal data, right? They use our personal data to make huge profits by selling them to uh, advertising companies. We know what's happening. They make billions of dollars from advertising using our data. The digital commons that we like to think with open source and open information and Wikipedia and so on is actually competing against a shrinking availability of open access uh, data. Because they are in the big big tech in Silicon Valley are dominating the way we receive social media and so on, and I think that comes to the the part of the solution. We need a strategy to restore the digital commons, the information commons, and we need to demand a sharing of any profits that are made from the digital commons, mm. that, from taking the digital commons. And that is in my final chapter, which is where I put forward uh, uh, my policy suggestions. And, and, and interestingly, I mean, uh, obviously, some of these things are morphing in the realm of, of the digital. But we've had traditionally also uh, some areas where I would probably think it, it would f you know, fall into your category, the plunder of the commons, where the business models are frankly absurd. Uh, look at academic publishing in journals. Of course. <laughs> right. So that's, uh, I mean, that's always strikes me always as one of the most uh, uh, crass examples. You know, the research is funded usually by public money, as professors are still mainly, you know, em employed by, by, by the state and by public uh, universities. The results of that work are given away for free. Uh, it's yep. being edited by your colleagues effectively for free. It's being, you know, uh, the added value, if you think about it economically, is almost negligible because you put it into a print template, that's all you do, and you sell it to the same institution that the originator of the work uh, comes from, in this case the library, <laughs> for a, a markup that is just absurd. Yeah, and the publishers, of course, make, make volume, huge amounts of, of profits from, from us as writers or producers of material but the, 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 the tragedy of the loss of the uh, education commons is that academics are, are being commodified. They're being commodified in different ways. If, if a star academic produces a MOOC, or produces a standardized uh, piece of work that is sold in huge numbers of copies, he or she will make a fortune. OK, but it's standardized knowledge that is fixed and is is just taught. It's not teaching people to think and commodifying of, of academics includes the fact that people want to publish in peer reviewed journals because that increases their their income. So they 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 write with the orthodoxy in mind because only the orthodoxy control those journals and therefore it constrains people's thinking and and gears them into a direction of selling themselves selling their time and of course the teaching gets gets down down prioritized the ability to uh, teach is constricted because the administration of universities are telling the professors and and lecturers that they must give high grades and get people through and, and, and so on. So the whole process, in a sense, is corrupted 
by the commodification of, of schooling and education. And occasionally you see a brave academic objecting and standing up for it, and they usually end up by being having their contract terminated. So we've got a, we've got a system where the education commons has been captured by the neoliberal state and the capacity of academics to have integrity in their commons has been lost. Mm. And this is a, a major crisis that, that we're facing today. And we need a strategy to fight back. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I don't see the problem particularly in, in any books. It's, it's really limited to these peer-reviewed academic journals and it's actually hampering the production of new knowledge because if you're a researcher and you don't happen to have a university affiliation, you have no access to the latest That's research. Right. That's right. If you are a researcher in a, in a developing country where the university cannot afford uh, to, to subscribe to all these journals, you cannot be part of the of the academic discussion pushing forward your field of research. So it right. is it is actively uh, a, a disincentive and actively a break on on innovation. And it's a fragmenting of the community because you get an elite uh, uh, insiders who are, who are taking the rental income and and determining what is done, and then you get a huge precariat in academia. And in teaching in general, with very very bad contracts, not able to, to influence development, cr crowded out of being able to get social mobility to move up in, in a system. And, and that is fundamentally different from the old guild character of education, where you went in and you climbed and through your teaching and, and, and abilities, you would gradually move through the system. But today that, that model has, has crumbled because most universities, if not all universities, are run by financiers, administrators who have no academic pretensions, no qualifications. And that goes through into secondary schools. Increasingly, we're seeing business school partnerships, which is ridiculous. And, and, and I, I document some of that, how it's happened in Britain. But, but the erosion of those things, erosion of a commons, erodes the ethics and the standards of the morality of, of a community, uh, as well as increasing inequality. Hmm. Uh, okay, maybe we could take this point to start you know, looking into the potential solutions. So what can be done about it? I mean, especially if you're staying with the example of the university system, it is a catch-22, right? So why are researchers publishing in these journals? Well, because it's uh, it's required for them to get a professorship and to be, uh, be advanced in careers. So so you, the university uh, it's themselves would have to change the criteria according to which they promote and hire people to set the distance incentive to you know publish in these journals which they have to spend an awful lot of money through their libraries to buy back right so it's a typical circular it's a catch-22 so where would you start i would start by by changing the governance of our education system i think the governance has to be restored to the teachers and the students and the community, the parents and the community in general. We have to take back control of our, our schooling and education system for the community, for the community of educators and the community of learners. Unless those that happens, a lot of the other things would get corrupted again. Then you start thinking, how do you prevent this credentialist approach, this commodification uh, approach, but you've got to have a, a, a different governance structure. Unless the academics control a university, then these things will continue. Unless, unless students have a role in the voice of what they're learning and, and, and how they learn, then they're going to be produced as commodities. We produce so many people with so many degrees out and so on. So I think the governance structure is very, very important in that. And, and, and I think then that we have to control the, the surplus that the education institutions produce for education, so that you, what profits are being made 
are channeled back into education, not into the pockets of the Koch brothers or the billionaires who are, are perverting our, our schooling system and our education system, particularly in the United States. Okay, and uh, the, if, you, if you look at, you mentioned the, the severe inequality effects of, of the plunder of the commons in, 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 in different areas. So how would you go about reversing some of these uh, developments and uh, what you know, establish a, a more balanced future? Okay, what I'm, I'm proposing, and this, this is the last two uh, articles of my 44 article Charter of the Commons in the book, Right. But I think they're they're fundamental. What I'm proposing is that all commercial profits that stem from using our commons should be subject to special levies or taxes that are built into a commons permanent fund, a form of democratic sovereign wealth fund. So, for example, if if uh, the water companies, which I believe should be renationalized, but as long as they are private corporations, they're using our water, they're making profit from our water, they should pay a special levy that goes into the commons fund. Those, for example, who are using North Sea oil or Scottish oil, they're making profit from our commons. Those who are making profits from the potash mine, for example, they're making profits from our commons. There should be special levy put into the fund to build up the fund. And what I'm proposing most of all is that we use ecological taxes uh, to build up the commons. The terrible mistake that Macron made when he raised uh, fuel uh, tax and, and fossil fuel tax was that he didn't recycle the money to give compensation to the ordinary people because as he'd introduced it, it is regressive. It increases inequality. But had that money, had he said the money that we're raising through that tax would be recycled to give everybody an equal payment, then the poor would not have suffered. They would have benefited. But he paid the price of the gilets jaunes, and uh, he, we can see what will happen. I believe we need much higher carbon taxes. I believe we, we should tax those who are polluting the air, creating toxic air, and compensate those who are losers by, doing, by putting levies. For example, a frequent flyer levy. People who fly a lot are causing carbon and other particles to go into the air. The people who suffer from that are more than anybody else. We all suffer, but more than anybody else are the low-income people who don't fly, who are living in low-income areas of congestion and, and pollution near airports and so on. So in a sense, we need a frequent flyer levy that go into the fund that would help build up the capacity for paying out, uh, paying out compensation dividends, which is a form of basic income. But, but the, the idea in the last chapter is that this commons fund be built, and then from that commons fund, as it's built, more and more could be handed out to everybody equally as a common dividend. Now, we, in building that, you have to follow what's called the Hartlick, Hartwick rule. The Hartwick rule is that you can you got to preserve the value of your commons for future generations as well as for current generations so that you only distribute the 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 returns on the fund that uh, that you can leave the value of the fund constant or building up and and i and i explain how that would work with the Commons Fund in Chapter Eight. Yeah, and it's a uh, it's a part of the of the general uh, idea that really comes out of the inequality research, is that if the Piketty relationships that he's established, if these relationships are true, 
there is simply no way you can counteract the effects just via the secondary distribution via the tax system. You have to intervene in the primary distribution uh, and that means basically you have to democratize capital ownership to make sure that the, uh, the income derived from that capital is not going into the pockets of just a, a few chosen people at the top, uh, but it's actually spread around society. Yeah, but I think that Piketty hasn't captured the nature of the commons as yeah. such. I mean, he, you know, his, his formula is, is really about how the, op the operation of capitalist economy. But what we're talking about is that, that a lot of people have witnessed the deliberate taking away of our commons, which are ours, they're yeah. ours. And that is an illegitimate profit-making system for which we should be compensated. I think that's a much stronger argument, a moral argument. Um, and it's an argument that is not based on envy. It's not based on, on saying we want redistribution because some people have been doing better than others because they're cleverer or whatever. So that the, the right cannot say that, that what I'm proposing is a matter of envy. It's a matter of common justice, common justice, that, that our commons have been taken away and we should be compensated for that. Yeah. And I think that is a powerful argument that the right cannot answer. I mean, I think the interesting point is it is exactly the same principle, but you define uh, the best possible starting point because the starting point is, is in an area that should not have been commodified in the first place. So you have, right. you have a right. very strong moral argument to start here, but it could, be, it could be basically the starting point for the general principle uh, that you have to redefine capitalism in a way that more people just benefit for it. And the commons, because they shouldn't have been part of the capitalist system to start with, is probably right. the best starting point to get going. That is well summarized. Thank you very much, Henny. <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. Uh, Guy, I'm, I'm sorry. That I've, I think that's all, unfortunately, we have time for today. It's been a fascinating discussion, as always, with you. And uh, yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll pick up the press. I hope to see you soon. Okay. Talk to you. Guy Stenning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henning. Cheers. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time. <laughs>